Welcome back to our talk, the place where we agree to disagree if we have reason to disagree. And my guest today joins me from New York, Pamela Miles. Hello, Pamela. So glad to have you on my talk show. Hello, Renee, and I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. You're welcome. It has been a while. Um, we tried to meet each other uh, in New York um, some five, seven years ago. Then uh, you were in Europe. Uh, Milano was an option to meet you, but it never worked out. So I'm very happy to have you here on uh, meeting you on this way again. Yes, agreed. I'd like to say a few things about you to uh, my viewers. Um, dear viewers, you probably know Pamela Miles. Uh, she is a very famous uh, Reiki teacher known internationally for many years now. Uh, she is an author and medical Reiki pioneer. She has brought the practice of Reiki to conventional medicine and started doing this already back in the 90s. Over the course uh, of 40 years of experience with spiritual practice, she's collaborated on various projects with academic medical centers, including Yale, Harvard, and the National Institute of Health. Pamela has been published in peer-reviewed medical journals, including the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. She's also brought her insight to corporate outlets such as Unilever and uh, Google. Um, and she has uh, been featured in mainstream media from televisions NBC and CBS to the print media, The Atlantic, Forbes magazine, just to mention a few. So we have a very famous person here to um, listen to and to talk with. Pamela has always struck me as a woman who has her feet firmly on the ground. Um, she, to me, always was uh, uh, somewhat of the impersonation of uh, a tough New York woman. Um, and maybe my preconceived opinions aren't all that correct. We will find out. Um, and I also found her always um, very courageous. Um, and I'm saying that, uh, Pamela, because I seem to recall, and I wonder whether you can help me with this. I seem to recall that quite a while ago, there was a picture published of either you yourself, and I think that's true, or one of your students in an operational theater. Um, and this is a way back, uh, 15 probably years, and it was a, not just a small operation, but the, a neurological or a cardiological uh, intervention. Do you know the photo I'm referring to? Uh, I don't know the photo because when I started practicing in the OR, it was before we had everybody walked around with a, a, a camera on their phone. And uh, so that it, it was in the 1990s. Um, and so I haven't seen the, uh, the photograph that you're referring yeah. to. I definitely was there. This is, uh, and, and everyone, uh, all the doctors in full gear with masks and, and, and headlights and stuff, and there's obviously an operation going on. And um, I just finished a small Reiki seminar here in, in Greece, they, on the island, they always happen impromptu, and I had a, a charming uh, young lady who wanted to do Reiki. And uh, I told her that I tried to get into the operation theater um, when my wife was um, she had a ski accident with uh, multiple f fractures of her sc skull and, and brain hemorrhage uh, and of course the doctors said to me no you're not <laughs> when i said i wanted to go into the operation theater to to treat her reiki uh, so uh, that picture um, is very vivid in my mind and of course you were truly one of the very early pioneers um, of, of uh, bringing Reiki to, to the medical field. Um, 
How, in summary, how skeptical, before we get into to our topic, how skeptical, uh, I'm curious, do you, did you find the medical profession? Uh, were they so averse to new ideas as many of us Reiki practitioners often think of the doctors? Actually, I found them to be more open-minded than I anticipated. Um, because uh, when I, I first started in hospital, I was quite sure that I would meet a lot of resistance, even though I was invited in. Uh, you know, I didn't make this happen myself. I was asked to help. And, um, and what I discovered was that the doctors were actually quite interested in what I was doing. This was um, just as the pharmaceuticals that are now available to treat AIDS were starting to be available. And so the, the doctors were still very aware that there were serious limitations in how much they could help their patients and how much their patients were suffering. And they recognized that what I was doing was helping their patients in a way that they couldn't. So I, I think that um, often when we think of doctors are being, uh, as being skeptical, we're right. They are skeptical. They're critical thinkers. This is important. But often it's not Reiki practice that they're skeptical of. It's the way it's being presented. And so this is why since the 90s, um, I have spent so much time trying to help Reiki professionals speak about their practice uh, in a way that is meaningful to um, doctors and nurses and other licensed healthcare professionals. You know, this is part of what I do in my Reiki and medicine intensive. I understand and uh, I agree with you. It was actually uh, only last week when uh, a French magazine uh, asked me to write a short article because um, my wife and I have a case study archive. And um, in that article I wrote about uh, the value of case studies to illustrate one case, but right. we cannot extrapolate that or and, and, and make a real deduction. And that's why a proper um, uh, scientific data bank uh, with uh, proper um, studies and, and um, the, the kind of work you've been doing is so important. Um, well, actually, Renee, if I could just interject. Please. <laughs> because please. Um, uh, yes, I have been involved in um, research and of course, we would always like to have more research. And most of the research that's been published on Reiki practice is not very good. The Reiki community gets very excited about it, but it's nothing that is impressive to people who understand research. So most of my work has been making Reiki practice relevant to the medical community without having the support of the kind of research that usually would um, be behind any new practice being brought into conventional medicine. Yeah, um, a similar experience uh, I made in, in the course of um, my exposure to the medical profession. Um, there, there has been um, a data bank which was established by the European Reiki Group, uh, but it's relatively new and it's really a collection of all the work, uh, which I agree, not all of that deserves uh, the title of being empiric uh, or empirically sound uh, kind of studies. But in the last five years, um, you know, um, uh, there is a long-term study, for example, in Germany, they did uh, on ovary, of ovary cancer and breast cancer in women in three different hospitals. And the, um, the peer-reviewed uh, articles by the doctorants are being released now. So, yes, I agree, that is a new development. Um, 
but uh, let's talk about the inclusiveness, although um, I think uh, we are on the subject already because uh, I presented you as a pioneer of um, inclusion of the Reiki practice in the medical field at large. So we are on the topic uh, uh, anyhow. Um, the word inclusiveness has become somewhat uh, fashionable almost uh, in the last few years. And I myself, I like it very much. And I'm very committed to inclusive spirits in, in organizations. Um, but uh, I think there is, there is something we need to um, shed some light on. Uh, because it can easily be also somewhat of an illusion, this inclusiveness. Um, because um, if you have an organization and you want to be inclusive, it generally means that you want to incorporate representatives of different trades or different styles or of, of different origins uh, and backgrounds uh, under one umbrella or bringing them around to at the same table or whatever metaphor one wants to use. Um, but the moment we talk about an organization, um, by definition, it also becomes somewhat exclusive. I mean, inclusiveness doesn't mean it's a, a, a anything goes um, uh, philosophy. Um, do you agree or how do you feel about this? I don't think we can have inclusive organizations until we have inclusive individuals. You know, people oh. who really hold the value of inclusiveness, of inclusion, uh, people who have trained their minds to look to see what do we have in common here? You know, what, what's the common ground? How can we start to create relationship? because the mind doesn't look for common ground. It looks for differences. That's, that's what its job is. And we have to expect it to do what it's made to do. If we want to be inclusive, we, we need to uh, you know, open that possibility within us. And to me, that means developing some spiritual maturity and um, and the only way I know to do that is to have a daily spiritual practice, like, for example, daily self-reiki. I mean, every day, not most days, not I try to, but more like um, I'd go without sleep before I would go without my self-reiki practice. You know, because that kind of rigor and that discipline is what is needed to train our minds. Our minds are relentless. <laughs> you know, they always want to look for what's wrong and how to blame somebody. You know, uh, and so you know, it, it takes a, a lot of of spiritual growth, which takes commitment and um, intense emotional self honesty. Um, I'm with you. I hear you. Um, I looked up a little bit uh, the definition of inclusiveness and um, I found an interesting little video, which maybe we get around a little later. But for now, um, one definition, I put it up on the screen. Inclusiveness is an aura or an environment of letting people in and making them feel welcome. So here in this sentence, I hear uh, something resonate, which I just heard from you, uh, that it, uh, inclusiveness is not the question of uh, 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 law, uh, bylaws and, 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 and regulations and uh, uh, agreements, but it's more a question of an attitude, of a, a basic inner, um, not even a mindset that's too limited too limiting uh, attitude is the, the best kind of consciousness is the best word i can find please help me out a little bit if you want to comment this um, uh, sentence here 
Yeah, I would say not only make them feel welcome because a good hostess makes people feel welcome, right? But we want to communicate that they are valued. And the way that we do that is by offering them a seat at the table and listening, you know, listening more than talking and listening from that inner stillness and silence that we develop a relationship with through daily self-practice. I'm going to keep coming back <laughs> to daily self-practice because for me, it's all hypothetical without daily self-practice. You know, we can talk a good game, but we cannot live it if we don't have that commitment. Um, I applaud you for that. And uh, uh, I'm very happy the clarity with which uh, you're saying that. And um, dear viewers, um, my guests and I, we don't pre-discuss the contents. We agree on a topic uh, and then um, we explore the topic as I'm doing now with Pamela. The topic is inclusiveness as we go along. Um, and here are the notes I made in my conversation with Pamela the last time. And um, we very quickly agreed that spirituality would be a title um, Pamela would like to speak about or discuss with me um, and then we explored a little bit further and immediately under the title spirituality there's a number of arrows going to practice 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 so you're actually uh, just repeating what uh, what you announced is so important to you um, in that conversation you brought up a number of very interesting other uh, catchphrases for me some of them quite frankly i I didn't know where to put them. Uh, one was th the word alignment. And you said alignment is very important to you. And it was potentially a title for our conversation, but we chose inclusiveness. Can you build a bridge between alignment and inclusiveness? Is there a parallel? Is there, are they synonymous uh, somehow? I think there are a lot of words that um, support one another, alignment, inclusiveness, um, harmony, integration, wholeness, wellness. And so alignment to focus in on that since you brought it up, you know, when we feel aligned with ourselves, then we're able to experience diversity in a positive way. When we're not aligned with ourselves, when we're in a defensive mode because we're not coming from being rooted in our own timelessness, that, that spiritual core that we all have, then everything is a threat. It, you know, it, it's, if you don't live with some experience of oneness, then you're stuck in combativeness. You know, so oneness and alignment are um, just two different ways of looking at that. Um, and the, if you're in a two dimensional kind of perspective, then alignment is linear. And, and that leads to combat, right? Push it out of your way. But if you're coming from a place of, of oneness, you can enjoy diversity and value it um, because you see that alignment isn't one dimensional or two dimensional. You know, that there are many, many ways to express these timeless values and endless ways to manifest them in our lives. And our lives are also different. We all have different details. Um, I'm not sure I'm happy I asked the question about alignment because what you just said is partly over my head. Uh, so intellectually, I'm not sure I grasped everything, but let me see whether my heart maybe comprehended a little bit of what you said. Um, because as you spoke, it reminded me of a dilemma I often see um, uh, in... in um, in Reiki masters, when they're talking about their own personal and spiritual growth, um, to me, it is something which 
um, it's a very lonely path. I have to go that path completely on my own. Yes, it's wonderful to know that parallel to me, there are other people walking in a similar direction or have the same goal. That, but, but the path I'm walking on my spiritual growth is a very lonely one um, or a very one uh, there it is in oneness it doesn't mean lonely in the negative oh i'm so poor i'm uh, left alone um and the dilemma i all often observe um and i don't want to say in others although i do see it there too but i also sense it in myself because there is this human wanting to be uh, a part of a group uh wanting to be b uh, belonging um uh, I'm having these art talks. It's such a fantastic media to get to know people like you and talk with them about interesting things. Um, so uh, obviously this, this satisfies a, a desire in me um, to, to, to be in exchange with others so that I can go my path on my own but I know I need to go it on my own. And sometimes that feels like a dilemma. And that's a little bit what I heard in your answer when you spoke about uh, alignment and oneness. Uh, do I make somewhat sense or? You know, we don't have to make sense, right? We're, <laughs> <laughs> we're expressing ourselves in a supportive way. And um, what you said reminded me of the great Sufi poet, Sayyid Hafiz, who said, don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut more deep. Oh, beautiful. There. But the idea of, you know, perhaps we have to be alone in that our practice is singular. And as we become, we, we live in awareness of oneness, then our singular manifestation, you know, our individuality is informed by that oneness. So we make different choices and we see people differently. For example, if you look at my hand, you know, there's five fingers here and they're all quite different and they have different purposes. And so the mind that's looking for differences will say, oh, well, which one is best? <laughs> this one because it's the tallest. No, this one because it's off by itself. No, that, you know, and, and make up all these stories. But when we are informed by oneness, we see one hand with five fingers, each unique, that can work together to create amazing things the work together and that that comes back to alignment so we can keep weaving these threads uh, into a, a beautiful tapestry you know of how can we be in this world and make a difference and not be critical you know not be as a friend of mine once said not always criticizing god's mistakes but still engaged in, in service. Very wise and very nice. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I have prepared, as I like to do, um, <clears throat> a, a small break in our conversation, a small video to look at. Um, let me show you what I picked out, um, I hope. Now I have to go and play it, just a second. Inclusiveness is not an idea. Inclusiveness is not a philosophy. Inclusiveness is not a campaign that you run. It has to happen in individual experience. We must understand the words like society, nation, tribe, this, that. These are just words. There are only human beings. There are only individual human beings. Unless, Unless it happens, happens in our experience, experience it, it is not a reality. reality. To, to bring, bring this dimension into education process, to bring this sense of inclusiveness into the economic process, to bring this dimension as a living process into our spiritual dimensions, 
if this does not happen we will go on dividing the world because right now we are using only one aspect of our intelligence which is called as intellect because the nature of the intellect is such it is a knife you cannot use it to stitch things together if you stitch with a knife you will leave everything in tatters the more effort we make in this direction the more destructive will become we will become we need to touch deeper dimensions of our intelligence which is naturally unifying this is so um i heard some of what sadguru um, he's talking here um uh, at the conference at the Global Education and Skills Forum. This was a few years ago where I picked this out. Um, and um, uh, a lot of what he said, I actually felt more than comprehended. I felt uh, um, what you said, what he said, there is compatibility, let's put it this way. Um, do you feel that way? Or um, what, do you, what can you say about what Sadhguru just said here? Uh, I agree with you and I agree with him and I love the image of the intellect as a, a knife. I mean, it's basically what I was saying too. And you know, it, there's a, there was a Hasidic uh, Rebbe, I believe that's where this quote comes from, but he said, may I never use my intellect against the truth. And so if truth can be another term for oneness, and when we talk about my truth and your truth, and you know, it, it, we're artificially splitting truth into my perspective and my emotions. And you know, th these things are important, um, but there is also a truth, the, the truth of oneness that is greater than all of that greater than anything that can be expressed. Actually, in this video, a little bit further on, because it was in context with education, he also um, said very well and very much to the point that in order to study things, we often separate them um, and look at, at the individual components to, to learn about them. Uh, but then we start believing that they themselves are an answer and are the truth whereas of course they're only a component of of something bigger of the oneness which you just uh described um and that's uh, what we see happening uh renee in um, conventional medicine you know with this hyper specialization and losing touch with the whole you know losing touch with the human being that we're we're serving, we're not serving the liver or the kidney. <laughs> you know? We're serving the human being. And, um, and this has largely happened since we see this uh, pressure to practice evidence-based medicine, which is basically taking uh, spirituality out of medical practice. And this is the first time in recorded history that we've been in that situation and, you know, it's not going very well for anyone. We have medical professionals with very high burnout rate, doctors saying they don't want their children to become doctors and uh, patients who feel disempowered. So spirituality, um, that experience of oneness is, is critically important to health and well-being. And, um, and we're fortunate that Reiki practice, just to bring it back to this practice that we both know and love, Reiki practice helps us to have at least some sliver of an experience of that oneness pretty quickly. And that means we pretty quickly start feeling better and functioning better and making better choices. So we, we get that snowball rolling down the health promotion side of the mountain instead of the disease promotion side of the mountain. I agree with you. Um, although I'd, um, I'd like to make a, a comment on the evidence-based uh, medicine, 
uh, I agree with what you said, but uh, this has become such a, a dynamics, a powerful dynamics uh, on its own, mainly because it's the manifestation of uh, the social interaction on all levels. Um, if people are not prepared to uh, cover medical aid uh, coverage, to spend money, if they, if they want everything cheap, uh, if everything needs to be um, uh, documented with a rational mind and society, people are asking for this. It's not necessarily dictated by, uh, by uh, medical doctors. And I'm glad you, you, you said how they suffer also. Uh, and actually, there's a very high uh, suicide rate amongst uh, medical people also. Um, but, but that's a, a social, a politically social uh, thing and not a, a political, uh, a medical uh, issue per se. Um, I, I made an experience with um, when we did, uh, uh, we, uh, we wanted to make a study in Switzerland um, in combination because there was a bilateral agreement with Lithuania and there was a, a Reiki master, a doctor who uh, invested in doing research, uh, breast cancer, and parallel there was this study in, in Munich, in Germany. So I was looking for hospitals in Switzerland to partake and I found the one hospital which, which uh, would have been the one to do it um, but the, the head of the, the chief doctor, he declined simply because his doctorants had so many projects already with complementary medicine, uh, where they did research and we would have had to be able to do it in five years down the road, which was too late for the, um, the bilateral agreement between the two countries. But the parting words of this doctor uh, were very impressive and I'd like to share them here because he said, um, you Reiki people really drive me up the wall. Why is it that when you visit a patient, your mother, and you treat them in a hospital, and we, the doctors, walk in, you pull away the hands and pretend that you're, you, you're whistling to the ceiling, why aren't you standing up for what you're doing? And when your patients and come to the hospitals, why are you not asking for Reiki treatments? Of course, the medical aid system is not ready yet to provide that. But if you don't ask, if you're not transparent, um, uh, uh, nothing will ever ch change in society. Um, and he instructed his nurses and his medical staff who did have Reiki um, that they would write it in their daily reports, even if it was just a short and brief uh, while giving medication uh, kind of uh, Reiki treatment. And, and he said to them, please put it down, even though we full well know nobody is ever going to pay for that. But if it's not recorded and accumulated with these recordings, it's, it's non-existent. So that was very impressive for me. I learned a lot from that doctor. Yes, and, and I just want to go on record. I never remove my hands when the doctors and nurses walk <laughs> in the room. I keep my hands on the person that I'm there to serve. And I catch the professional's eye to see. And, and you know, if I can even ask them, do you need me to step out of the room? Because sometimes they have something that they need to do right then. Sometimes they can do it with me in the room. And almost always the doctor or nurse will say, no, I can come back. What you're doing is more important because they see the patient relaxed, serene, composed, resting it, it, to a degree that they've never seen before. They've only seen that patient in, pain and anguish and they understand that the body and the mind need to rest if people are going to heal but conventional medicine isn't good at healing it's good at fixing so i'm going to say something really radical and i want everybody to listen up and look this is my primary health care i don't get my primary health care from a doctor or a nurse or any other professional, hands on my body every day. 
Reiki self practice, about half an hour, often longer. That's my primary health care. And that enables me to stay in alignment with myself, with the world around me. And it also helps me be aware enough of myself to notice if, if something seems headed in a not so good direction, if I'm heading out of alignment and more practice and investigate, you know, take a look. Do I need something besides Reiki practice? And many times I do. So I, I am, uh, you know, as to my research, the, the person who started the first ever Reiki program in a hospital, I have always been concerned about the medicalization of Reiki practice. And I've always represented it as a spiritual practice rather than as energy medicine. And of course, that's something we could talk about for a very long time. But I invite people to at least consider that because spiritual practice means it's something we do to come back to alignment with ourselves, to come back to our hearts so that we can experience inclusiveness. Oh, we can use our minds. We want to use our intellect. It's important to be able to make discernments. We don't want to be so open-minded that our brains fall out, right? But using the mind in service of the heart, we have to spend time in communion with our hearts to be able to do that. So this is my primary health care. And I practice every day. And I have ever since I learned to practice Reiki in 1986, which was something I understood because I already had a daily meditation practice and I was a yoga um, practitioner. So I understood the idea of practice. And practice is what supports inclusiveness. Wow, wow, wow. I can only subscribe to that. There is nothing I could say I disagree with. Uh, oh, yes, the term uh, spiritual practice. I, uh, I uh, particularly when I speak to uh, medical people, um, I often call it a holistic pra practice. But that's nitpicking on words and, and the essence. Uh, I'm so happy about what you said. Thank you very much for your kindness. But holistic is spiritual. That's the, the spiritual perspective is the perspective of wholeness. So we're saying the same thing. And always when in conversation with someone, you want to speak to the person in front of you and use words that are meaningful to them and yet convey your meaning, you know, your, your perspective. And if you have to explain a little bit, uh, you might say uh, Reiki is a subtle practice. You know, you don't always have to use the word spiritual. I'm just using it here. And and uh, I just tried to uh, be in disagreement and find something to disagree with. Uh, so I was nitpicking on something. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, thank you very much, Pamela. Um, there's there's one or two more things, maybe just very briefly. Um, when we spoke in our um, conversation uh, a week ago, and we agreed on inclusiveness. You said an interesting sentence, and maybe you can elaborate. I am so inclusive. I'm very inclusive, sometimes to my detriment. What, what did you mean by that? I would rather let someone in and let them misbehave up to a point then decide, oh, that person's going to misbehave. That person's not, doesn't really understand what we're doing here, is not going to be able to honor the values. I'd rather give people a little more space than that. And um, I, you know, I feel like I, I have the space within me to make allowances. That's what I was talking about. So I hear you um, rather giving the person the benefit of the doubt 
yes. uh, and find out uh, maybe something which where the writing was on the wall to some extent, uh, but give give create an atmosphere and an environment where this is happening in the here and now rather than via preconceived opinions and via prejudgments and things like that. That's that's what I just deduce from what you said. Yeah, and give the person a chance to feel included and valued and that this is a place where he or she belongs and see because, you know, maybe the anger that is infecting them is on its way out and this experience will help it. So I would rather, I, I like that phrase that you used, benefit of the doubt. I'd rather give people the benefit of the doubt because otherwise it's just, you know, like Martin Luther King Jr. said, hate is too heavy of a burden to carry. Yes. Yeah. And, and the amazing thing is you give them the benefit of the doubt and most of the time uh, the result is actually very different to what you thought the writing on the wall was. Uh, that, that at least is my experience that, uh, of course, there are uh, misbehaving uh, situations, but, but uh, not equally as often, more often than that. The exact opposite is the result when you, when you come and meet people with the kind of attitude you just uh, described. Uh, I'm coming to an end. Uh, I've been, been driving to an end, as um, uh, you probably sensed, Pamela, but I want to give you um, uh, the last words to whatever you want to say. I have a personal question, though. And dear viewers, I have to let you in on something very interesting which happened. Because um, I spoke to Pamela a week ago, for two, three minutes, and somehow, like I just did a moment ago, I used the term preconceived opinions. She allowed me to finish my sentence, and then she said, I wonder, Renee, what your preconceived opinions are about me. So I'd like to return the favor to you, uh, Pamela. What were and are your preconceived opinions about me? Just as a personal favor to answer that question, and then you can have your final words, please. I actually am not in the practice of holding opinions about people. What I had seen of you, um, the, the very idea of reconciliation is very valuable and that you would devote so much time and energy to it and be willing to seek out people of divergent perspectives, I mean, that's something, Benet, that I related to so deeply, you know, I, I saw that common ground between us because I've always been more interested in the person in the room who is the most different from me because that's where I have the most to learn, you know, mm. and, and learning has always been important to me. Okay, of course, I was fishing a little bit for compliments, but never mind about that. You uh, you said very wise and nice words, and yes, I agree with you. I think that's uh, where, where there is a commonality between the two of us. Uh, and I know in our conversations, we've had many uh, discussions where we were not on common ground at all, uh, but that was always in the spirit of agreeing to disagree on, on a subject. So... Pamela, what's your final goodbye words for today? We can be both mystical and reasonable. Being mystical, experiencing oneness, living lives informed by oneness doesn't make us positional. It helps us make the best possible choice out of the choices that are available to us. So being a mystic, being a dedicated spiritual practitioner doesn't mean having, um, being judgmental. 
know, to be able to see differences and understand and appreciate that each of us is doing the best we can in any given moment. You know, compassion comes when we see, <laughs> okay, I'll just speak for myself. Compassion started to arise when I saw how doing my very best, I fell so flat on my face. And, and then something started opening up that, you know, I, I could be sensitive to the vulnerability of being human and that we're all living on that edge of vulnerability and uncertainty and to be poised in the midst of uncertainty. That's why we need spiritual practice and we need it in a consistent way. Not like, oh, you know, people say, oh, I practice Reiki when I need it. I mean, we need it 24 seven, it seems to me. You know? <laughs> like, so it, 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 why not just practice once a day? Isn't that easier than practicing it every time we need it and start to develop resilience hmm. in your system and to move out to speak med speak a little bit, to move out of that sympathetic overdrive in which we're defensive and we're, we're sure somebody is out to get us. Well, somebody may be out to get us, but we're better positioned to address that reality, if it is a reality, if we are in our parasympathetic state, if we are in our heart, if we're in the state nervous system state in which our bodies and our minds are able to heal. So this is my primary health care. This is my primary spiritual practice. And thank you so much for this opportunity. I so appreciate it. I'm really honored and I am um, deeply respectful of the work that you're doing. It's very kind of you to say. Thank you very much, Pamela. Uh, thank you for having joined me. I'm looking forward. Uh, maybe resilience is going to be the topic you and I will discuss in an year or so or half an year. Uh, thank you very much. I wish you a wonderful day. Bye-bye, uh, Pamela. Bye-bye. And bye-bye, dear viewers. That was a very entertaining. I hope you found um, issue of our talk. Please subscribe and uh, watch in three weeks' time. Bye bye.